you know, you hear about mites and mites and mites, and rightly so. They kind of are public enemy number one when it comes to honeybees. But this lecture is to reassure you that there's plenty of other things that are wrong as well. And there's some genetics in this talk, but the intention is to not bludgeon you with DNA and chromosomes and genes, and I hope my job will be successful if you walk away saying, oh, okay, that was useful and uh, interesting. And once again, this lecture sort of falls into that camp of big picture that helps you explain things that you see every time you go into the beehive. And so that's, that's where we're coming from. Starting from the bottom up, this diagram is talking about one of the meta-truths of natural history on planet Earth. I mean, this is, this is a big picture as far as big pictures ever get. This is it. And if there's something that we can say that's, that's consistent and repeatable, and that is that the history of life on this planet has been the history of smaller units glomming together into successively bigger units in a hierarchical fashion. Smaller leading to larger, leading to larger, in sort of like an upside down pyramid. So let me kind of talk this through. At the very bottom we have these unlinked nucleotides, which are just simply components of genes, just sort of floating around. And they can and they do replicate. They are replicating molecules. That is what they do. But we don't see just unlinked nucleotides just floating around. They tend to lump together and form replicating nucleic acids. And the most famous nucleic acid that I promise you've all heard of before is DNA. And DNA is a replicating molecule. That is its modus operandi and its raison d'etre. That is what nucleic acids do. Well, we are just sort of loose fragments of DNA occur out there, but by far most of them are lumped together into some kind of a cell. They link nucleic acids joined into chromosomes bound into cells, and then it's the cell that reproduces and becomes the reproducing replicating unit. And then you have cells that glom together and form multicellular organisms, and that's what you and I are. And then the individual cells will differentiate into different functions. You'll have liver cells, you'll have lung cells, you have heart and brain cells. And this is the level of evolutionary transition where you and I live, and the majority of living things on Earth fill this niche right here, the niche of the organism. But at each one of these stages, that, that pattern is replicated. It's not like evolution has to reinvent the wheel every time. It just reapplies the same method every time, just at a different scale. And that's an important revelation that we sort of figure, figured out from the social insects. The social insect biologists are the ones that contributed this insight. Because if you look at some of the old life history textbooks from the 19th century, they would have like the age of the fish. And then the age of the fish turned into the age of the reptiles. And then the age of the reptiles turned into the age of the mammals. And there was no explanation between those two. It was as if each of these stages was its own independent innovation. Well, we now know that's not true. It's the same pattern happening at a different scale as it moves up the uh, ladder of evolutionary transitions. So we have small replicating units glom onto bigger replicating units, glom into cells that are replicating units that glom into other cells to make multicellular organisms that are replicating units. And that's where we are. You and me, plants, humans, guinea pigs. But you know there's a big but coming. There is one other evolutionary transition that is above the organismal rank, and that is the superorganism. And that's when organisms glom together to form a single reproducing unit. And so you see the metaphor here, don't you? We've landed at the honeybee colony. Because the honeybee colony is a superorganism, which represents the highest of our evolutionary transitions in the history of this planet. Isn't that cool? Our honeybee is sort of the poster child of the highest rank in evolutionary transitions on Earth, and it's even higher than us. 
that is cool. Okay, that is cool. So there are certain characteristics of each one of these stages for this to happen. Each of the components have to have some kind of an agreement. They're going to say, you know what, nucleic acid A and nucleic acid B, we're going to glom together, but we're just going to sort of harmonize our differences and agree to reproduce together. And hey, cell, I'm going to glom with you, and we're all just going to kind of subsume our selfish interests and agree to reproduce as a multicellular organism. That, that's a hurdle. That's hard because genes are inherently selfish. A gene is only successful if it reproduces. It's also true that most of the time the best way to reproduce is to join with other genes. Cooperation has been rewarded handsomely in the history of Earth. In fact, life as we know it would not exist without cooperation. And I always like to say this when I'm talking to general crowds about evolution, because sometimes it's characterized or caricatured in a negative sense. Oh, selfishness, oh, survival of the fittest, oh, conquer, or de conquer, or destroy, win. When the flip side of that coin is at least equally true, that the best time to be a best way to be a competitor is to cooperate. So cooperation and selfishness is this, this tension in the history of life on this planet. And evolution accompanies both of them. So just be aware that the superorganism is higher than us. Um, there are some problems with the superorganism, though. It is inherently less stable than the organism. There's a reason why organisms predominate in their numbers on Earth other than superorganisms. It's because the organism is more stable than the superorganism. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. The poster child, of course, is this chromosome right here, DNA. DNA is a complicated molecule. It folds back on itself in huge ways. And it's this famous structure. It is like a ladder that is twisted. And if you grab a piece of this chromosome and start pulling it, you could unravel it, and you get that all of this chromosome is one unbroken chain of DNA. That is DNA, the biological replicating molecule. And it occurs in these chromosomes, as we know. And normally, chromosomes occur in pairs. And diploid animals like you and me and most organisms, we inherit one pair of the chromosome from our mother and one pair from our father. And they, they physically pair up. They, 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 they come together. And, and this is especially apparent during the formation of our gametes. And in the case of um, honeybees, they have 16 pairs of chromosomes. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. And then they, they line up like this. And back in, the, back in the 60s and 70s in biology, they could create, they called them karyotypes, which is a type of photograph of the chromosomes in the cells of organisms. And you, they line up like this. They, they pair up according to size. Well, there is some animals that have only one set of chromosomes. And this, in the honeybee world, is characteristic of these guys, the drones. This is true of the entire order Hymenoptera. In the Hymenoptera, which includes the ants and the wasps and the bees, the males don't have two pair of chromosomes. They only have one. They truly have no father. Okay? You've heard the thing about drones have grandfathers, but they don't have fathers. It's true. I know it's weird, but it's true. Okay, they only have one set of chromosomes. I had a professor at LSU who said they're sperm with wings. And that, that, that really is true. Oh, here's another thing. Have any of you ever spotted out in your yards like green-eyed drones, white-eyed drones? Okay, I see, see. Okay, I got some hands going up here. Yep, okay. There's red-eyed, there's green-eyed, there's white-eyed drones. And I saw this for the first time when I was a kid. Um, uh, I, I grew up in Indiana, and my dad farmed. We had uh, soybeans and corn, and we'd grow hay. And I would always track wherever dad was putting the sweet clover is where I'd put my hives that year. And, and, and one year, I had all these green-eyed drones, and I was freaking. I was like, Dad, what have you been spraying on the clover? You know, and uh, 
It wasn't until I went to LSU and learned that um, the reason this happens in drones is because of this. They have only one set of chromosomes. So if they happen to carry a mutation for eye color on one of these chromosomes, and it, these mutations, by definition, are recessive. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're easily dominated if the other chromosome has a dominant form of that gene. But if you don't have a dominant to oppose the recessive, then you're going to express your recessive. So, so drones who have recessive mutations, they show. Whatever they got, they show. There's no dominant form of the gene to mask it. So that's why you see these weird um, visual mutations in drones more than you do in workers, because most of the workers have another set of chromosomes that masks the mutation. Okay, so what this means for us, don't despair. I'm not, this, this is going to be a lot simpler diagram. I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, what this means, because the males have only half of the chromosomes, this makes for some really strange and lopsided genetic relationships in the honeybee colony. What you're seeing here is generation one, two, and three in a colony that is haplodiploid, this is what I'm talking about, like the hymenoptera where the males have only one set of chromosomes, monandry, and that is, means the, the female has mated with only one male. So here we have a female, generation one, mated to one male. And what this means in the hymenoptera is that a mated mother is related by 50% to every egg she lays. She's normal because she's diploid. She has two sets of chromosomes. Females have two, only the males have one. And so her relatedness to her offspring is exactly like our relatedness to our offspring. You have your child shares 50% of your genes, just like the honeybee queen. She's only related 25% to any of her grandsons. Now remember, a worker can lay eggs if the queen's pheromone is removed from her. Her ovaries can activate and she will lay eggs. But because she cannot mate, her eggs will only have one set of chromosomes, and so they will be male. And her mother, the queen, is only related to her son by 25% which, incidentally, is the same as you and your grandchild. A worker, as I just mentioned, an unmated sister, they're able to um, lay eggs, but, and they're going to be related to their sons by 50%. So far, so good, because we're talking about female inheritance. But she's only 37.5% related to their nephews. So what this means is not everybody gets to reproduce in the nest. A queen, if she has um, mated with one male and she has her daughters staying at the nest, she's not going to be interested in her daughters producing grandsons with whom she has only 25% of her genes in common. And a worker, if she wants to lay eggs, and they can, and they do, and sometimes they escape the queen's pheromones and lay eggs, she's going to be related to her son by 50%, but she's not going to want to help her sister produce a nephew with whom she's only 37.5% related. So there's this comp the stage for competition. Is set. This is why the superorganism is less stable. You got these competing interests inside the nest, depending on how much genes they're passing on. And in evolution, the coin of the realm is the genes that you get to pass on. The more of your genes you pass on, you win. So what's going on here? There's going to be policing going on. And what you're seeing here is kind of a dim, kind of a dim image, unfortunately. But these are workers. This is an egg, a worker deposited egg, and this worker is entering in head first, and this worker is eating the egg. You see that right there? And this is something that we've only known since the 1990s, and it was published by Francis Ratnix, who is a professor at the University of Sussex in England. And he was able to document this policing behavior. A queen is not going to want her daughters to lay eggs. 
They do every now and then, but she comes around behind them and eats their eggs so that they can't. And sisters will eat each other's eggs. It's like, you know what? I want to raise my sons. I don't want to raise your sons, so I'm going to eat your eggs. So you see the competition that's set up inside the social insect colony. So there is competition over who gets to reproduce. This is showing kind of a generalized schematic of how social colonies come about in a, in a very simplified way. And what we see is a solitary nesting bee in a solitary soil tunnel here where she's excavated a little lateral cavity and deposited a ball of pollen and laid an egg on it. And usually they just uh, leave it at that. There's no parental care whatsoever. This is what we see in the solitary species. Here in B, we have something going on. We got two that are cohabiting. We don't know if it's two independent foundresses. We don't know if it's a mother or a daughter. We don't know if it's two sisters, but we have cases like this where two individuals will nest in a burrow and apparently both of them are reproducing. But then there are some species in which we find like two brood cells here but one, two, three, four, five individuals, which is our first evidence that somebody is not reproducing. We see the first evidence here of the division of labor, where some of the females are doing foraging activity, other of the females are focused in brood rearing. We're starting to see the first toe, for first sticking your toes into the water of sociality here. So there's more things that come in play once you start living together. You've seen this slide before. This is one mother mated to one male, but now we're gonna talk about something different. Because of that crazy asymmetry in the genes that males and females have in the Hymenoptera, a mated mother is related by 50% to every egg she lays. However, her sisters, her daughters, are related to each other by 75%. Okay, this is important. A, in, in the order Hymenoptera, if a mother is mated to one male, her daughters are related to each other by 75%, not the normal 50%. This is where things start getting weird with the order Hymenoptera. There's this asymmetry. And when this was first recognized, it was considered a eureka moment. It's like, Eureka, the scientist said. He says, we have uncovered the key to sociality. Well, it's more complicated than that. But think about what, what, how exciting it was at the time. And this, this, was, this was ramping up in the 1960s, right, when I was growing up. And by the time I got into graduate school, it, was, it carried the day. The reason there's sociality is because of this asymmetry. The, the sisters are super related to one another. So it is better to stay at the nest and help mom produce more sisters than for me to go out on my own. Because if I go out on, the own, on my own, the most I can do is deposit 50% of my genes with every egg I lay, but if I stay with mom, I can pass on 75% of my genes if I help mom make more sisters. It's a no-brainer. It's like a, the Darwinian you know, jackpot prize. Well, we know that that's not the answer, okay? Because there are diploid species that are eusocial. Uh, one example is there's a species of shrimps that are eusocial. They cooperate, some of them reproduce, some of them don't, but they're totally diploid. There's also a species with the charismatic name, the naked mole rat. And it is a disgusting little thing. It's a, it's about, it looks like a wiener. Uh, it's hairless, it has no eyes, and it is a rodent. And it, it's, it's about three inches long. And they're very common in central tropical, central tropical Africa. And they're totally eusocial. There is a queen naked mole rat, and there's worker naked mole rats, and, but they're, they're diploid. So it's beyond the scope of this lecture, but just know that this is not the explanation for eusociality, but they thought it was back in the 60s and 70s. So 
What this means, however, is that mated mothers are always going to be interested in a one-to-one -one sex ratio. They don't care whether they make a female egg or a male egg. Every one of them passes on 50% of their genes. But their daughters prefer a three-to-one ratio in favor of sisters. Why mess around with helping mom produce brothers with whom I'm only 25% related, when I can help her produce sisters with whom I'm 75% related. So this is another tension in the superorganism. They not only disagree on who gets to reproduce, they disagree on how many females and males we need to have. It all boils down to the genes, and it really does boil down to the math. It's amazing the coherence between math and biology on these kind of things. So we kind of got problems here. What's, what's, what's the solution going to be? We got all these tensions. How are we going to resolve them? Well, this is where we have great moments in evolution come to the rescue. Gary Larson, you got to love him. You know, God, he had, he had a cartoon for everything. And that's the nice thing about Gary Larson. All of his characters look the same. So if you're with somebody and you're talking about a Gary Larson, you can describe the cartoon, and they totally get it. So anyway, here we have it. And we have one of those great moments in evolution in our animal, the honeybee, and that's called sex and lots of it. Multiple mating. And what you're seeing there is a mating cloud, and we got the queen copulating up here uh, with, with a male. And she stopped this moonandry thing. You know, why stop with one? You know, that kind of a thing. And she started practicing polyandry instead of monandry. She started mating with multiple males. Now, there was a lot of benefits that came around with this. I'm going to show you one of them genetically. Here we have now that similar diagram you've seen before, but now we have rape relationships in polyandrous colony. And just to keep things simple, I've got one female, but this time she's mated to two males. In reality, they mate with anywhere from 10 to 20. And so what this means is we now have in the colony, it's, it's messy. Okay, the paternity has suddenly gotten messy because we now have multiple patrilines in the same colony, different daughters from different fathers living under the same roof. This has consequences, as you can imagine. If you have, on average, 10 subfamilies, if the mother mated with 10 males, the average worker relatedness now drops from 75% to 30%. See that? No longer are the daughters 75% related to one another. The average across the nest is now 30%. So by this one act of practicing promiscuity, and storing the sperm and making a genetically diverse colony, the mother has erased that sex ratio conflict that was going on in the nest. In the nest. Now the workers take a big hit because now they're passing on only 30% of their genes. So definitely the workers have taken a hit. However, it works because now the colony is becoming more fit because it's only in those colonies that practice polyandry that we start seeing spectacular ecologic success. Here's an interesting little factoid to hang on to. I have said earlier that organisms carry the day on planet Earth, and that's basically true, but they don't ecologically. Bear with me here. There are relatively few superorganisms on Earth. The numbers of species that qualify for this are probably in the neighborhood of 10,000 species, whereas there's millions upon millions of organisms. So superorganisms are numerically rare because these evolutionary hurdles are formidable, and very few species have done it. But once they do, the jackpot is enormous ecologically. Here's a metaphor for you. I'm um, holding in my hand, need two hands to do this. You know that, that statue from Savannah, Georgia, the Garden of Good and Evil? Okay, I, here I am, the statue. And I'm a, I'm a weight. So I've got here on my, my right hand, I've got the weight of all of the vertebrates on Earth. 
I'm going to put on this hand all the weight of just the ants. I'm not even going to include the termites or the bees. Isn't that amazing? So keep in mind. Keep in mind the distinction I'm making here. The numbers of species are minuscule, relatively speaking, but their sheer numbers and their economic prominence are unmatched. It really is the planet of the ants. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? So is superorganismality successful? Yes, it is. And it's also extremely rare. But we just don't perceive the rareness because once they breach it, then their numbers of individuals are huge. It's just, it's just a, a fascinating thing. And honeybees really encapsulate this. And honeybees are a superorganism that can literally be dissected and put back together again, and it stays alive. You know? So that's why honeybees are, are so valuable research animals. They're, right, they're, they're at this stage, and we can study them in great detail. Okay, so this is one benefit of the mother practicing promiscuity. Uh, she has erased the sex ratio conflict among, with her and her daughters, and the colony has gotten genetically diverse, and consequently it's ecologically more robust. It can weather a larger variety of insults and hardships that the habitats throw at it. But, there's always a but, isn't there? God nature. I wish it was easy. But workers are still related to nephews by 37.5%, to half-nephews by 12.5%, and to their sons by 50%, which means workers are still always primed for mutiny. There are things that keep that in check. Uh, we've talked about policing. Policing is very common in the early stages of social evolution. When, when colonies are making that first step, let's test out this group living thing. Let's see if it works. Well, that didn't work. Let's retreat. And there are species that do that. They try, and then they revert back to solitary life. But for those that say, hey, let's try it, Whew, that was hard. Well, we got through it. We're, we're reproducing still. Okay, let's, let's try this. Okay. Okay, we're still reproducing success so far. Hey, let's try promiscuity. And it's like, whoa, 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 way over here. Super, super ecologically successful. That's kind of the vector. There are species that are at different stages of that continuum. Bumblebees are a good example. They, um, in, they usually mate with only one male, so their colonies are smaller. They're not as interesting. They're not as morphologically distinct. Uh, a, a worker is just a little queen, and a queen is just a big worker. You know, there's no morphological distinction between them. They don't have all of the, the caste division of labor that honeybees do, but yet they're eusocial, but they've only mated with one male, and so consequently they don't have the genetic robustness and uh, diversity that honeybees do. But they're always primed for mutiny once you have crossed over into the superorganismal rank. Now, we too have risks to mutiny. Uh, we too, at the organismal rank, have to deal with that because any one of those cells in our body could say, hey, you know what, that thing about cooperation, you know, forget that, I want to reproduce on my own. And we have a name for that, don't we? Cancer. Mm -hmm. I lost my wife to cancer a year and a half ago. So you can see this has sort of taken more than a professional interest in me. But this, and I would dare say there's not a person in this room that has not been touched by this disease one way or another. I promise you, 100% of you have, have, have experienced this in some form. And I think this is an important point to make. Cancer is not some alien thing imposed on us from outside. It's not a pathogen. It's not a virus. It's not an external insult to our bodies. It's an internal insult. It is integral to our evolution. And it goes back to that very first slide that I showed you. Lower increments, pairing with bigger, pairing with bigger, pairing with bigger. And at each stage, that requires a tacit agreement 
that we will subsume our selfish interests in favor of the greater whole that we just made. And sometimes participants say no. And at every stage for that stage to occur demands that there are checks put in place against that selfishness. We've talked about a couple of them with the honeybees. One of them is promiscuity. She mates with a lot. And so that cuts down on the, the tension of sex ratio in the colony. Uh, policing, eating each other's eggs is another way that it's done. Uh, pheromones, in the case of the honeybee queen that suppresses the worker's ovaries. But each one of those is in place to check that selfishness from emerging and asserting itself. We too have checks. And this is probably the big advantage of organisms. And our great check, our great ace in the hole for avoiding cancer, is the single-celled bottleneck of the zygote. Okay? In sexually reproducing diploid animals you know, and organisms like you and me, our genetic conflicts are resolved because all of our cells are clones of each other. And this happens when we are conceived. When the male's sperm fertilizes the female's egg, you have one cell, and that one cell divides over and over and over and over and over a gazillion times and produces all of our organs, but they're all carrying the same DNA. All of our cells are clones. That's not true in the superorganism. So because we go through that single cell bottleneck of the zygote, this is organisms' great advantage over superorganisms. It makes all of our cells clones with one another, and that you know, dramatically, well, it eliminates genetic conflict. So the reason it breaks down is when other checks begin to deteriorate in our bodies that lets that um, selfishness express itself. But that is the biggie. That's the big one. That's the big advantage of being an organism. So don't forget that. Organisms are structurally and always will be more stable than a superorganism. And don't forget that cancer is just integral to our structures. Okay? It's not something exotic from outside. It is the structure from within. I don't know if that's a comfort or not, but it's an explanation, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, bees do get cancer. In fact, we're going to talk about that right now. Here's what cancer looks like in a superorganism. <clears throat> it's called the worker ovary. Remember, workers are always poised for mutiny. They want to reproduce. You know, they, they produce, okay, laying workers lay male eggs, right? They cannot mate, so in the order Hymenoptera, that means they're going to turn into males, which is like drone brood like this. They're crappy egg layers, you know, in their, in their, in their um, evolution from a solitary bee to a worker versus a queen bee. The worker genome lost reproducing type of behavior, but they gained cognition, they gained morphology. Workers are far more interesting than queens. Queens are just boring. I mean, queens are nothing but just ovaries and a bag of pheromones. I mean, they, they have no behavior. They're, they, they, they're even simpler. You realize queens have no corbiculum? They don't have a pollen basket on their legs? You know, they've even lost that. They're just worthless except for eggs, and, which is a lot, you know, eggs and pheromones. But, but it's, it's the workers that are, are smart. Workers have greater cognitive capacity than the queens do. So one of the things the workers have lost in all of this is egg-laying behavior. They're just really bad at it. You know, the typical two, three eggs laid haphazard inside a cell. There, 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 there. They've just lost that behavior. But they still manage to get some produced. And so you get this, you know, rotten brood pattern like that where you have laying workers. And, and they succeed. There's a certain number of these worker produced males who mature and they participate in, in drone congregation areas and they, they get their genes out there. So a worker can reproduce. But when she does that, the genome, the part of her genome that is maternal and that is cooperative is suppressed, it is down-regulated, and so that she loses the capacity for social cooperation. 
It always happens. When you have laying workers, they not just lay eggs, they stop working. Okay, this is why laying workers are so crappy, a laying worker colony. It's not that they're laying drone eggs, it's because they're not working anymore. They're only selfish, me, 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 I'm going to reproduce, I don't care about the colony anymore. So this is one form of social cancer. This is a good place to interject about the Cape Bee. The Cape Bee is a race, remember I was talking this morning's lecture about the subspecies, well one of them is Apis mellifera capensis, named after the Cape of South Africa. And there is a small region, a very small region, where the Cape Bee is native. And it is thought to be the very tip here where modern day Cape Town is. Apis mellifera capensis is unique because its workers can reproduce diploid eggs through parthenogenesis. And this happens sometime in the plant and animal world where fertile eggs are just spontaneously produced by the female um, and it produces viable diploid offspring. You know, this, this happens in biology. The cape bee is an example of this. And so what the cape bee does is it will um, lose a queen, but the colony doesn't die. It, 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 it can survive. They will, um, some of the workers will, the queen pheromone is removed, and so they start laying eggs, and a significant number of those eggs are worker eggs, workers giving birth to workers. And the colony can limp along like that for a while. And then eventually, the colony will rear one of those larvae into a queen, and it goes back into a queen right phase, and the colony rebounds. It just vroom, it surges. It, 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 re, it recovers. It comes back. And so Cape bees in their natural habitat ebb and flow from a, from a queenless to a queen right phase. And it is thought to be an adaptation for high rates of queen loss on their mating flights because it's extremely windy and very exposed there in the Cape of South Africa. And it's presumed that this evolved as a means of weathering queenless periods, which were quite common in that part of the world. Yeah. The question is, so when they rear a queen from these worker-laid eggs, is she strange in any way? No, she's, she's perfectly functional. Yeah, they can go back to, and she mates. She outmates, and they, you know, hum right along, yeah. <laughs> no. They do not kick out the laying workers. They, they can revert back to a subordinate situation. <laughs> it's cool. But here is something that's happened, though, with the Cape bees, and this is an artifact of human manipulation. Uh, migratory beekeeping is not unique to the United States. You know, other countries do it, too, and South Africa is one of them. And beekeepers in northern South Africa have moved their natural bee, which is scutellata, by the way, they have migrated scutellata on, on trucks, you know, just like we do, down into the Cape Zone. And when they started doing that in the 1990s, a new nefarious behavior of Cape bees was revealed for the first time. And that is parasitism. Cape bee workers will invade scutellata colonies, kill the queens, take it over, and the colony go, becomes capensis. The trouble is, all laying workers are crappy colonies, okay? And so um, a, a, a laying worker colony of scutellata is a rotten honey producer. And what do you do about it? Who is the laying, where is the cape, which one of these is the cape worker? So it has become a serious issue in the commercial beekeeping in South Africa. And they are essentially social parasites. In fact, they are recognized as a social parasite. And this raises an interesting point. Is there anything higher than the superorganism? I've had people sometimes say, hey, how about Gaia? You know, the Gaia principle, that all of Earth is one super. Well, there's problems with that, uh, not the least of which science always works with replication, and we only have one Gaia. <laughs> So we cannot answer that question. That is an unanswerable uh, question. But suffice it to say, we, there's been some talk and interest in maybe ecosystem organismality, you know, different subspecies, you know, different species interacting, but there's really no empirical confirmation of this. It appears that superorganism is as high as it gets, 
And once you go past that, you have dissolution. And I'm going to show you one more example of that here. Here's what happens about the relationships in a Cape colony. You got this strange thing where they're clones. And we got workers that are giving rise to other workers. But this shows, which is, which is like the ultimate jackpot of all, if I can reproduce a clone, that's 100% of my genes. It doesn't get any better than this. So this is what Darwin would really like, you know. But there's ecological constraints against that. Um, I guess chief of which would be boredom, unanimity, um, no opportunity for novelty. So it does seem that the end point of the superorganism is parasitism, social parasitism and social dissolution. I want to say a couple other things here. Um, have you ever gone out to your hives, found a queenless colony, or found a rotten queen, and you pinched her head, and you wanted to get a new queen, and you get on the phone, or you click, and you get a new queen arrive a day or two later, and you take that new queen, and you put her in a hive, and you do whatever it is you do to make them accept her, and they do. Have you ever paused and wondered, why do they do that? Why do they accept her? She's an alien queen. She has no relatedness whatsoever. Well, this appears to be an example that in that transition to adapting for polyandry, that nepotism was downgraded in Apis mellifera. It really is an example where it's better to cooperate because I get more of my genes out that way. But there is one exception in mellifera, and that is the queen. The queen was, is, and remains utterly selfish. Okay, evolution is not perfection. Evolution is optimization, which means whatever works is what gets passed on. It may not be the best, but if it works, it passes on. And this is just where kind of mellifera has landed. Worker or queens during the normal queen rearing cycle, if they emerge and if she's, um, if the colony has swarmed, then that new queen that emerges, she will go down the row and kill all of her rivals. And you can tell this cell right here has been opened naturally, but these have been aborted because they've been ripped open from the sides. That's how you can tell a cell that has been aborted as opposed to one that emerged normally. Ecologically, it would be to the advantage of the species to tolerate multiple queens. We see this in ants. Ants have huge colonies. Sometimes they can cover an acre or more. There's no boundaries if your nest is terra firma. You know, there's no boundaries. You can sprawl as much as you want to. And so I think this is the reason why we see polygyny, poly, poly females, more than one female. We see that exclusively in the ants and the termites because this amorphous, huge nest. So that, that means that out in the frontiers, that little queenlets can arise far enough away from the central empire that they can get away with it. And you can't do that in the small confines of a hollow tree if you're evolving in northern Europe. So I think it's a spatial thing that has kept polygyny from evolving in bees, whereas it's very common in the soil nesting uh, social species. But my point here is, um, it would be the species' benefit to practice polygyny, but they don't. And I can prove to you why it's to their benefit if you practice double queen beekeeping. Okay, here's something practical for you. You can do this if you have a strong colony coming out of winter. You can bas basically make a split, put the new queen and some of the brood above a queen excluder, keep the old queen and the rest of the brood down below, put a couple supers between them, give them a double screen with their own flight entrance, let both queens rear brood and build up a foraging population. And then after you know a few weeks, you can take away the double screen and let them co-mingle, and you'll have a ginormous population that will produce more honey. You don't have to kill the old queen. You can use her somewhere else. So I, I did this when I was living in Indiana, and I, I, I stopped doing it because they made too much honey. I had to use step ladders to go out there, and I thought, yeah, this, this isn't worth it. You know? so, but it was an interesting experiment to show how ecologically... Ecologically, it's a winning situation. 
but mellifera just doesn't do that. So, you know, they're missing out a little bit. Evolution is not perfect. I gotta leave you with this because it's bizarre and it's fascinating and I think it answers a lot of things. There is evidence, again, for this social dissolution in the form of parasites. This is another form of social cancer. This is workers trying to cheat and here's what it looks like. This is a paper that came out in 2005, and it's subsequently been examined again by my colleague Dave Tarpey at NC State in North Carolina and independently confirmed. So we're pretty confident of this. Who gets to be queen? Who inherits the kingdom? Queens have a little bit of influence on who is their successor. And they can do this by depositing eggs in queen cups. And you know those queen cups, and they are statistically predilected toward becoming a queen, more so than a worker-sized cell. So a queen, when she lays an egg in a queen cup, she has a pretty good chance that that cell will, in fact, become a queen. Statistically, it's a little bit better. But what if it's a secondary swarm? Okay. And it's not the queen who picks the larva, but it's the workers who pick the larva. What happens then? There is evidence from that paper that I showed you from 2005 that there are some subfamilies in the honeybee nest that are overrepresented as queens, that they are destined to royalty. And it works like this. A queen has laid an egg. One of the patrilines is a parasite. And that parasitic larva shouts to the nurse bees at the top of the cell, hey, you up there, yeah, you, you, feed me. Feed me royal jelly. Don't feed him, feed me royal jelly. And they do. They use pheromones to prompt nurse bees to feed them royal jelly. And so these parasitic paternity lines are overrepresented as the next generation's queens, which is really kind of freaky, but here's the super freaky part. They do not exist as workers. The, the workers who don't get royal jelly, they just don't appear. They, they, don't, they don't show up in the population. Virtually none of them show up. So it's either a queen or nothing. Isn't that bizarre? This is another bold-faced attempt at parasitism. This patriline of workers is saying, hey, this worker thing, eh, I don't want the worker thing. I want, I want to go for the prize. I want to be the queen and only be the queen. And there is a certain repeatable number of patrilines, drones, that are spreading these parasitic genes out there. This, again, is a bid for you know, for, for, for dominance and selfishness. So um, there is a um, snake in paradise, isn't there? What this means for us as beekeepers, I remember from time immemorial, the mantra was always raise and use queens that have been raised in a swarm impulse. Because early spring queens, they've gotten lots of food, lots of nectar, they're swimming in royal jelly, they make the best queens. So you always want to have queens raised in a swarm impulse. And the supersedures, well, you know, they're not so good because they weren't necessarily raised in spring. Well, now we know it may not be that. It's probably because they're parasitic. How does this work? This is, this is, what this means is the bizarre reality that it is better to use a human grafted queen than one that the workers chose because the workers are vulnerable to these parasitic cues and they will be more likely to pass on crappy production than a larva that Billy Bob grafted because Billy Bob is not vulnerable to any parasite cues from the larvae. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? God, I love it. All right. Okay, let's wrap up. I heard clapping, and I know there's a lunch in our future. Uh, let me just re kind of recap these points. Here you go. Um, workers are always poised for mutiny. Queens and workers disagree on sex ratio. Queens don't tolerate rivals to the cost of the colony. All of which tells us that cancer is always a threat, but it's checked 
by social constraints. In organisms, cancer is checked by the single-celled zygote, that bottleneck that makes all of our cells clones. The superorganism does not have that luxury. We have no evidence that there is any evolutionary transition higher than the superorganism. In fact, to the contrary, we have evidence for social dissolution beyond the superorganismal rank. And finally, supersedure queens are very likely parasites, social parasites. Human grafted queens are good. Weird, isn't it? That's the end of my prepared comments. I'll be around. Thank you.